Uh, what a lad. Well, this is it, guys. Today we are lucky enough to be joined by one of the greatest players in the modern era. He's a one-club man at all levels of the game, having starred for Canterbury, absolutely dominated for the Crusaders, and has forced his way into the All Black 10 jersey more often than not. And along the way, he's won almost everything possible multiple times, including five Super Rugby titles. He is an incredible player and somehow even a better lad. It is one of the greatest to do it. Richie Moanga, welcome, brother. Cheers. Oh, what an intro. How good. Thanks for having me, bro. Mate, stoked to have you on. It's always good to be in the presence of greatness. So, mate, no better than you at the moment. So, stoked to have you on. No, it's... um. Sort of memories go back to, you know, the f- early water lad days of uh, pranks of Fletcher Smith. I think that had me in, <laughs> <laughs> had me in stitches. So I'm glad I'm here for a, um, a you know, a potty, not not for a prank. Unless you got something planned, but. No, I remember you hitting me up in the changing rooms. I think it was after um, the Salisi Jaunty <laughs> one and you came up to me saying that you were loving it. <laughs> but ever since, I've just wanted to get you on. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> so, anyway, how's how's the break been? You've got an extended break from Super Rugby. How's how's that been? Yeah, it's good, bro. It's um, it's really nice to be home, and I guess uh, with the circumstances, with the lads heading to Queenstown, it sort of it was a good fit. Um, not having to leave home and um, you know, spending time with uh, my two wee ones and my wife. So, it's been good, but um. You know how it is when you're watching and you get sort of itchy feet wanting to be out there with the lads. Um, you know, it does get a bit hard, but really excited to, you know, to hopefully jump back in soon. Mate, you'd definitely be catching up with some family time. Obviously, you had a long end of year tour. Hard hard to be away from the family for that long, but um, you're probably making up for that now. Yeah, it, it is tough and, um, you know, everyone had to go through it. Um, and it was sort of kind of unique because, you know, the All Blacks hadn't for a long time gone through something like that. Um, and I, I had a, a baby just before I left. Um, little Marley was was two days when I left to, to go over to Oz. Um, so that was tough and it had its challenges leaving, leaving family behind. But uh, making the most of it now and just, yeah, just enjoying, uh, you know, being a dad and, and seeing them sort of grow. Hundred percent. Then, did you miss the preseason? I know a lot of guys are stoked when they get out of preseason, but did you did you miss it at all, or you're pretty happy just sitting back? I'm someone that sort of enjoys the sort of the, the hard work and the mahi. Um, so I was sort of doing my own work, but yeah, you kind of miss it being in with the lads, and you know what it's like. Um, you know, the bonds start off early in preseason, and and the work that you're doing it just sort of binds sort of the connections uh, stronger and. Um, as tough it, as it is, um, you know, your memorable moments and memories sort of come in pre-season and how sort of shit and tough all that work is. And how's, how's your body now? Are you feeling good, feeling ready to go? Bro, I'm ready, eh? I'm ready. Um, I just can't wait to sort of rip in. But at the same time, it's been quite nice just sort of taking a step back. Um, sort of when Super rolls around, um, you know, we we'll kind of just get chucked in and you kind of right in the thick of it for, you know, the whole season. So it's good to sort of step back and I'm enjoying seeing, um, you know, other players lead and just seeing um, things from a different perspective. And, you know, obviously with, with Ferg and Simon, um, just loving the way that they're going. And, um, you know, it's going to be tough coming back in and, and trying to sort of... Um, climb my way back or, or try and earn, earn, a, earn the jersey again. So um, that's a challenge I'm looking forward to. But, yeah, I can't wait to get, get back in. Mate, how stacked is your side and especially your back line <laughs> at the Crusaders? Eh? Like, you guys still have heaps of guys to return. And at the moment, it looks like you guys are just on another level still. Yeah, it's, it's um, we're pretty spoilt for choice. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, especially the outside backs, I think it's the hardest place to sort of pick at the moment you guys got got guys like Lester who played the way he did in the weekend and um you still got you know classy outside back on the bench you know like Severis last weekend so um was sport for choice but um guys are pretty they they're pretty grounded and we know how quick things can change if you don't perform one week 
which is a challenging yeah. thing playing um, in our team because um, it can cost you a spot on the bench or it might mean you might have to have a week uh, week a week of rest, which is which is niggly, but it's just the way it is. It, um, you know, the highest level and, and being in a competitive uh, team. Mm. So when is your return? Uh, hoping to come back for Chiefs. Um, Chiefs or Blues. Um, Chiefs the earliest, but yeah, hopefully it's just been a bit tough. You know, there's there's only a handful of us at the moment training back here, so uh, not able to get sort of, you know, the contact I need or sort of game-like situations, uh, which is tough, but it be nice to see some of the boys uh, after this week when they come back, so... Yeah, it'll be good. Mate, it'll be good for everyone to see you back out there doing your thing and doing what you've been doing on this competition for the last five years, absolutely killing it. But like I do on every episode, uh, we need to hear the journey back from the start. Um, I know you're a proud Cantabrian. Um, give us the rundown on what your childhood was like. Yeah, I'd say, um, yeah, my, I had an awesome childhood, awesome upbringing, um, a family of six and... Uh, born and raised in Christchurch, which uh, I'm really proud of. Uh, it's quite funny whenever I, boys ask me or, or they ask, you know, where I was born, they just assume I was born in Auckland or something and then moved to Christchurch. Uh, <laughs> but I'm one of the few, one of the few Brown brothers that are actually born down here in Christchurch, uh, which I'm proud of. Um, but yeah, just grew up um, in, in a loving family and a supportive family. And, and my dad was, uh, was a code head. And um, basically gave me no choice or option but to play footy. And um, for that, I'm really grateful for. But, you know, earliest childhood memories was him taking me to um, my registration, my club registration. And, um, yeah, playing for Marist Albion. And uh, grew up in Upper Rickerton here in Christchurch. And I went to Rickerton High at, uh, year nine. And then had the opportunity to go to St. Andrews College on a rugby scholarship, um, which was good timing because uh, I think the wheels are falling off. Uh, I w- was really only going to school to eat my lunch and, and check the ball around. But, um, yeah, I think it was a sort of a lifeline for me to sort of pursue my rugby career and take things a bit seriously. So, uh, yeah, went to stack. And then... Um, yeah, leaving school, just joined the academy at, uh, for Canterbury and not long after made my de- debut for Canterbury in 2013, um, mm. which was just an awesome time to join the franchise and sort of have a little glimpse of what, um, you know, being a Canterbury rugby player was about because you had such awesome role models there at the time, like Andy Ellis, um, you know, Anasi Manu, I remember, who was a huge part of, um, you know, the culture. Um, you know, your Adam Whitelock and Tom Taylors and Tyler Blindale was the likes. It was awesome to be in a team with those um, those players. And, um, you know, you kind of it just flashes by you. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you're kind of the players that... Um, you're kind of like the Tom Taylor of the team, you know, you've been there for five years, six years, and you got new kids coming up. Yeah. So uh, amongst that, just the whole heap of footy and um, crusaders and, and just sort of climbing my way through the ranks and trying to, I guess, sort of make my mark in the, in the Canterbury and Crusaders jersey. So going back to your school days, did was there a time where you thought that rugby was going to be a career for you? And is that sort of why you moved to... Um, St Andrews? Oh, bro, I think, like, to be honest, like, from as, from as far, like, as far as I can remember, I was always going to be a rugby player. Um, yeah. I was always going to be where I am now. Um, I wasn't arrogant or cocky, but I had this confidence that I knew that I could do it um, from a young age. Um you know, I'd say mostly because I was so passionate about rugby. Like, I actually just loved mm-hmm. footy. I loved the Crusaders and I love the All Blacks and just watching rugby with my old man and my brothers and um, every spare minute just kicking the ball. Like, I, I loved it. And I think because of that, I always knew I would sort of do whatever it took to um, to be at 
um, this level and to play for Crusaders and um, hopefully one day be an All Black. Um, so yeah, I'd say from a young age. Mate, that's so cool. So, d- so did your touch background uh, have anything to do with your rugby career? Because I know you are very good at touch. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I, I knew from a young age, you know, from six or seven, that I always wanted to to be a Crusader and an All Black. But touch didn't. I didn't start playing touch till I was year ten. You know, till I was fifteen, sixteen. Um, and that was only due to, to going to St Andrews College, who um, who were pretty good at touch in the mixed grades. Um, so I'd say touch had a huge influence on sort of adding bits to my game, adding adding tools to my toolbox in terms of my catch pass, um, my vision, um, quick feed and acceleration, and um, and all that stuff and and everything else, but. Yeah, I, I just absolutely love touch, bro. I think it's just, um, you know, one of those games that I still say now, you know, if it was professional, I think I'd be playing touch, you know. I, I just loved it that much. Um, True. You know, mainly because yeah. of the fact that I didn't have to make a tackle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not that I make any not that I make any um, tackles at the moment, <laughs> but um, I, I think I just loved it because of the flair and, and – um, you know, I was able to express myself, bro, and it was awesome that, you know, it gave me that sort of freedom to do that, which I do get in rugby often. Um, but, yeah, just I just love the competitiveness and um, the dynamics of the game, you know, where people think touch is quite, you know, pass the ball around, but, um, you know, it's very yeah. strategic, um, you know, for those that have played it at a, you know, a high level. Yeah, it's such a cool game, eh? So underrated for rugby development I couldn't agree anymore yeah huh and so is it true that you missed out on the New Zealand schools at the end of your school schooling year yeah bro yeah yeah I did I um I went to the schools trial uh which was up north and um we had like a schools camp and like you know there were some big boppers there right? you know you like your Jackson Garden Bishop and and guys you just you know when you're you're playing in the South Island and you're you're like a, a smaller school, and you just hear the names of like, man, these are the next big guys that are gonna, you know, um, yeah, that are gonna take over footy, and um, you know, it's quite daunting when you're going from a little school, or even when you're just a South Island schoolboy, um, because these guys are giants, bro. You know, these guys are, um, they're just the head of you know the game in terms of like their built and just the way they play. So I went to the trial and um, if I remember, I remember getting like, I remember getting stitched up big time, eh? Like I got 10 minutes in the trial, eh? Oh, true. And, um, <laughs> but I still like, even like now, I feel inside <laughs> I'm real bitter about it. <laughs> you can tell, eh? I'm like, <laughs> uh, um, I got like 10 minutes, bro, and like they called, you know, and that was full time, and I was like, if I didn't even get a crack, man. Um, but yeah, uh, eventually, like a week later, I got the phone call saying that, um, yeah, or hey, look, uh, Richie, like, um, yeah, you didn't make the, the team, and blah, 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 and, you know, whatever was said after that, I can't even remember. But like, I just remember, like, my heart dropping, bro, like, you know, like, like it was like I was being told that like I actually can't pursue my rugby career anymore. Yeah. Like that's how serious it was for me. Like that's how bad I wanted to make this team. Um, and I remember even back then of hearing stats of like those who make schools, um, there's a percentage of those guys that make the twenties. And then if you play twenties, like you're guaranteed pretty much to, to play super rugby. Yeah. So like, man, all these stats are going through my head, man. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm so gutted, eh? Um, you know, eventually, yeah, I'm, I'm in tears um, about not making the schools team. But um, I'd probably say, you know, it was probably the best thing that happened to me at that stage and sort of didn't make me any more motivated, but um, just kind of knew I had to sort of keep sort of grafting away, really. Yeah, because I guess you had that confidence that you're always going to, get there and I suppose that was probably your first setback of your journey to become that professional rugby player that you always knew you would so um, interesting to hear how you handled that yeah yeah well it's just you know it's just kind of um, 
as you said, it was a sort of my first setback of like, far out. Like, I didn't make this team. Mm. Um, what does that mean for me now? Um, which is ridiculous, you know. I was bloody 18 years old, you know. Um, yeah, looking back, eh? <laughs> looking back, you kind of like, what an idiot. But, um, <laughs> you know, talking to uh, my first 15 coach at the time, and he was just like, you know, it's it's one man's opinion, Um you know, literally one man's opinion. Um, and he said to me, I remember, you know, cream always rises to the top. Um, so he was saying this to me on the phone, kind of sort of like comforting me. And, and meanwhile, in my head, I'm like, shut up, man. I, <laughs> I don't want to hear this. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't mean anything to me right now. I, I, did you not just hear what I said? I, I didn't make the team, bro. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you look back and at those moments and, um, you know, a whole heap of other moments too that sort of, I don't know, shape shape you to, to who you are. Mm. So how did you go from missing out on New Zealand skills to the following year being into the Canterbury uh, NPC side, one of the powerhouse sides of the comp? Oh, bro, I don't, it was, um, it, it all happened quite fast, eh? So I, I went to a club called um, Limwood here in, in Christchurch and I remember sort of my last year of school going around to clubs asking um, sort of what the club was like and, and w- where do they see me playing next year in their club side and mm. um, just kind of having those discussions. And I was always certain my last year of school that I was going to play senior rugby the year after. Um, you know, looking back, bro, I was like, 75 kg is not not much <laughs> smaller than what I am now and I just come out of school and um I just was certain I was like, I'm gonna play senior rugby out I don't care where it is um but I'm so determined to just play senior rugby because I think I, I can and I think I'm good enough and so like I kid you not I went around to five or six clubs literally saying to them I want to play senior rugby here and every coach and every um, RDO said to me, um, you're too small um, and that we see you playing Colts uh, before you before you make your way to seniors. Like We've actually got a 10 who's playing seniors. He's handy. Play a few games of Colts and then you can move your way up. And um, I was just like, nah, st- nah, man, stuff there. <laughs> I was like, nah, no way. Um so it's funny, I went to, I had a meeting with our tech coach now for the Crusaders, his name's Scott Hansen, and uh, he was the head coach of Lumwood at the time, and so I had a meeting with him, and he said, if you're good enough, you're old enough, you know, and he just basically said that, um, yeah, if I'm, if I'm good enough, I'll play in the senior team uh, for Lumwood, which was like the last team I wanted to play for. Um <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it turns out sort of they, you know, they didn't have really numbers to field a senior team, so they just needed anyone and everyone pretty much. So <laughs> it was it was good for me to, to join that club. And, um, yeah, I, I just had a pretty good season with Linwood, which sort of um, put me in the mix for Canterbury. Now, you must have absolutely carved it up to go from not being able to get a um, starting spot for a class side <laughs> to starting for Canterbury or playing for Canterbury. Yeah, like it, it did happen fast, bro. I, I I played my first game for Linwood and we played Sydenham, who won, who won it the year before. And so our first game, and it was my first senior game, and we played at Rugby Park. And um, I just had like... Like everything went my way. Like I, I just couldn't believe it. I scored uh, 32 points that game on my debut, and um, I think I scored a hat trick and a couple of kicks and stuff like that. And um, for me, it was just that feeling of like I knew I was right. I knew I was able to play at this level, um, and I knew I was you know deserving to be there. And that was just sort of made me more hungry to to keep performing well and then which led to me being in the in, in the Canterbury mix uh, once they had injuries and 
Colin Slade was getting caught up to the All Blacks every, you know, every couple of weeks, um, which gave me an opportunity. And were you still really confident in your ability going into the Canterbury lineup? Did you did you think you were good enough to be in there as well? Um, no, nah, that, that sort of changed, eh? Because you know when you're in with the big fish, eh? You kind of like, oh shit, man, like. You know, like I, I was just le- I just left school, man, and, yeah. and and now I'm here with you know like a Tyler Blindale and Tom Taylor, um, Robbie Fruin, um, Adam White, like Johnny McNichol, like you got all these guys that um, who'd been there for a long time. Um, I was just sort of more keen to learn, um, but it was it was cool. Like I played I played nine games that year. Um, and we won, we won that that year, which was really cool. A cool introduction to sort of NPC. Um, yeah, I just I, I just loved it, eh? Mm, and then your form from that is that what got you into the New Zealand twenties? Yeah, I, I'd say I'd say I think you know with twenties and with um, you know they look at players that are you know it's, they can't help but look at players that are really playing at NPC level, you know, like yeah. a. You know, you had Simon Hickey with our 20s team. He was captain. He was playing for Blues, bro, and he was ripping it up, you know. He was – I vividly remember him and Tavita Lee were in our 20s team, but they were putting on a show with, with the Blues. And um, Anton was another one who was with the Chiefs. Um, so that all sort of – just sort of led, uh, you know, one thing to another with making those teams and just sort of – um, putting in some work, but the twenties thing was was pretty cool, and we we bombed it in our in our year. We lost it at home uh, in the semis against South Africa, but um, it was a cool experience, and you kind of knew that. Oh yeah, this is definitely what I want to do, and, and definitely what I'm you know capable of doing. Yeah, I remember playing against you. Uh, I've just spoke about it on Damien's one, but um, we were playing the Hurricanes to Valentine. You were. You were the 10 for the 20s, but even back then, oh. like, you, were, you were so classy. Everything you did was silky smooth, and um, it was obvious you were going to have a big future after I saw that. I remember, I think I, I remember it was you. There was like a uh, Mike, Mike Kainga was playing. <laughs> yeah. Um, bro, yeah, you just, yeah, things like that, uh, you just, um, you know, a, bit, a part of your career, you think, well, at the time, 20s is, is massive. Um, but it's a good lesson in t- like terms of when you think something's really important of just having another perspective of, you know, the true meaning behind it or that's not your everything or if that doesn't go well, it's not the end of the world. And I think 20s was the same. You know, I made the team, but I wasn't the starting first five. I still wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, so it just sort of gave me more uh, motivation to keep training hard. And Razor was your coach then too, eh? Yeah, bro, yep. So he, he was our coach in 213 for Canterbury, and uh, he was coach with 20s with um, Chris Boyd and uh, Rangi. Um, so he had, had a pretty good coaching side. So you've obviously had played a lot of footy under Scott Robinson. How How's your relationship with him? What's he like as a coach? Um, it, it's funny. Like I'd, My whole professional career, I've had him as a coach bar one year, which was um, super rugby my first Super Rugby, um, my first Super Rugby season, which was in two sixteen. Yeah. So apart from that season, I've had him as a coach basically all the way through my professional career. So, like, I'm really lucky and grateful for like our relationship because we've just been on this journey together. Mm. And when I was starting out as a player, like he was starting out as a Super Rugby coach too. So we have a real honest relationship. It's it's. Um, yeah, it's really honest. It's he know he he's real demanding on what he wants from me as a player, and you know I have the same for him as a coach, and he's just really cool. It's I think what you see is what you get with Ray. Um, you know, people have a lot of uh, opinions and um, different things to say about him, which is um, which is cool and funny. But I think one thing about Ray's is a lot of people underestimate him sort of technically as a coach yeah. and just sort of how good he is and um, 
just the vision that he has for for his teams. It's, it's pretty special to be part of those teams and to be in that culture and in that atmosphere and, and seeing him every day in his uh, in his work. Mm. And the results speak for themselves, to be fair, don't they, mate? You guys, I think you've won it every year since you two have formed your combination in the Super Rugby. So it's a pretty impressive, <laughs> uh, pretty impressive run. Yeah, it's 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 good, bro. It's fun, and um, I think like uh, he puts in a lot of work. Hey, eh? you know it's um, mm. you know you see the things on TV and and you know comments he makes or his personality, but yeah, he actually really works hard and. Um, it's cool to be, you know, working for someone and, and playing for someone that you know is really honest about his mahi and about um, what he's trying to achieve with the team. Um, you know, and long may it continue that, um, you know, all that. And your rise for, into the Crusaders was pretty rapid as well, wasn't it? Because in 2015, I think you were about the fifth or sixth, first choice 10, and then the following year, 2016, you're pretty much straight into number one. So what was that rise like for you? <laughs> Bro, it was crazy, eh? Like, I just... Like, I just never would have ima- imagined that it would have happened that fast. Like, I was in the wider squad in 2015, and I had... Um, I had Carter, you had Desi, you had Slady, Tyler Blindale, and Tom Taylor, and then I was the fifth uh, first five. Yeah. So, at no at any state, I didn't even think I was. I, I knew I wasn't going to get a run that year. I knew I was just there to sort of learn and, and hold the tackle pads. But I didn't never imagine that all all four of them ahead of me would all leave at the same time, um, <laughs> which is just crazy. But it sort of threw me in the deep end. And you know, in terms of all the years that I played rugby, two sixteen was one where I just learned the most, bro. Like I was just I was humbled pretty quickly. And just um, went through a real rough patch of of getting beaten up and and just losing games. You know, we lost to you guys, the Canes, and um, it taught me so many good lessons, and it taught the team good lessons. Um, but yeah, that all happened pretty fast. It was, you know, I probably wouldn't want it any other way. To be fair, it was it's kind of good. Yeah. Did you feel extra pe- pressure um, replacing Carter? Obviously. Canterbury legend, and you're you're the next guy in that ten jersey. Was, was there extra pressure around that? Yeah, there was, man. It was it was hard, sh- you know, big shoes to fill in terms of you know the greatest of all time uh, has left, and now everyone's like, oh man, now we got this guy. Like, <laughs> it's <Yeah>. um, <laughs> and I was still trying to find my feet and still trying to work things out. So, um. I guess my personality just sort of helped because I was so so driven and so focused on what I needed to do or how could I be better um, mm. and just how driven I was. But there was a lot of outside noise. But to be fair, I'm sort of not one that sort of pays too much attention to that or or even if I am, uh, I don't really let, let it get to me um, that much. And were you still really confident that you were still going to be a successful um, driver of this Crusader side, even after 2016, where you felt like there was a lot of learnings? Uh, yeah, I was, but I was definitely certain of that. But I learned some, yeah, real tough lessons, as I said, around, you know, um, being humbled, real, you know, being humbled and grounded around. Um, not being consistent and, and having like shocking games, you know, like games where um, I've just been dragged off the field or I've missed um, five goal kicks um, in South Africa where like you just, those lessons are so valuable now, like for me. Um, but at the time, we're just so hard to learn because all you want to do is just be really successful. But um you know, those things have just made me to who I am now. But yeah, for sure, like it's just it was a, a roller coaster. But I always knew, like you know, this is you know where I am now. This I always imagined this. Mm, it's crazy. But you obviously learnt really quick because the next five years have been the opposite, been really successful. You've driven that side so well over the last few five years. You've I think you've won MVP pretty much on all of them. So. Um, 
any sort of standout games or um, finals that really stand out for you in your um, Super Rugby career? Um, far out, man. That's tough. Like, there's so many memorable games, and among some of the titles, like, you know, at the time when you win them, you're just thinking in your head, like, this is the best, you know, this is the best feeling, you yeah. know, and you just can't replace it. Um, but then you sort of look back and one season that in particular that I think I, I like the most because of the journey was was 2017 because it was our first year of um, of winning it. And I guess the journey of, of going across to Johannesburg and playing in that environment, right. in that stadium, um, and we hadn't won it. Crusaders hadn't won it since two, uh, 2008. Um, so just that joy of you've done something that you've dreamed of um, ever since you're a little kid and to do it with guys that had won it in 2008 like a white crocket was just pretty special too. And um, yeah, I think I'll always remember that one just because of the journey of, of, of watching the Hurricanes versus Lions early hours of the morning. And then just thinking, shit, we're on the plane, man. <laughs> like, the, like, yeah, yeah. There was an emotional roller coaster of getting there and then far out. The unknown of, you know, there were so many boys that hadn't played in the final before. So I think that one was pretty special. And they came home hard too, didn't they? With Even with a red card, they were like <laughs> coming home with full steam. Oh, you guys were bro. running on your last fumes we were hanging we were hanging on like as you know playing in high altitude and and the when the crowd gets behind them they're just unstoppable you know and had there been another 10 minutes bro you know like i'd say most of us would say we would have lost bro like it's just (laughs) we were hanging on and that's what made it even more you know just enjoyable of how hard we had to work and how much it actually hurt you know you get that sort of taste of blood in your throat of just hanging on and um, yeah, that was pretty, yeah, that was a lucky one. And five championships, that's five championship do's. Um, any, any end of your do's that really stand <laughs> out for you? <laughs> I know you go good. <laughs> oh man, I'd say, um, I'd say 219, eh? I can already just say, I could just, yeah, 219, you know, you got the likes of, you know, the, the older guys that, that are sort of, you know, um, their last hurrah, you know, like a Ryan Crotty, um, Tim Bateman, um, you know, Owe and Rito, uh, their last season with the Crusaders. Um, you know, and that was that was just memorable in terms of, um, yeah, just doing it, you know, again and, and, and all that jazz and the shenanigans that happens after. It's just, it's just awesome, eh? It's, it's, I love it. Yeah, get your goggles on. Do you guys pre-order your goggles knowing that you're going to win the comp? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, nah, man. There's no talk about goggles. There's nothing, eh? There's, um, you know, Razor, he's really creative, bro, and he's really on to it. So um, he, he, I'm sure he had them just ready just in case. Um, you always want to be ready, you know, just for the best possible outcome. So I guess that's what happened, and, and thankfully – uh, we got to wear them. Oh, did you what? Five times. How good. Anyway, I'm keen to hear about your all-black career as well. And you had quite a unique um, start to your all-black career, playing against them before playing with them. Talk to me about that and how that whole experience was. Oh, man, it was like, um, it was it was pretty weird, I, I guess. In terms of the game, um, you know, I never thought I'd be standing in line, sort of arms, you know, sort of holding your brothers and you're facing the haka. I think that was the weirdest thing that I've ever experienced because, you know, one, it's you want to be on that side and you want to be the one performing the haka. Mm. Um, but it was awesome, you know. We play, played at, a, um, at Twickenham and it was actually just a real cool week because we'd been with the Barbas and uh, along with the traditions and, and celebrating that week. And, um, but knowing that you're going to be playing against, you know, the best team in the world is just, it was quite funny. And I think, 
I think I was actually, you know, really happy the week was the way it was planned. You know, you kind of just going through and you're celebrating and you, you're doing all these uh, events that the barbarians do, which makes the week sort of go a bit faster. Um, and then all of a sudden you're facing the haka and that was, <laughs> it was pretty crazy, man. How loose is the barbarians? Is it as loose as people say? Bro, it is, man. I think, you know, I get, the stories you hear, you know, they're true in terms of um, the week and the preparation leading up to the game. Um, you know, the Barbarians are a special club. You know, it's what a team that you you got to be invited to play for. Um, and I think sort of knowing the history and the traditions of the Barbarians, um, when you get to camp and when you get to London, all you want to do is sort of put your best foot forward mm. and sort of um, and carry on the traditions and... I think that's a cool thing about it too, you know, the, the coaches at the time, uh, we are Robbie Deans and Razor, um, sort of like anything goes because I think because it's not up to them to make rules about how the week should look or, or it's not up to them to make new things up um, in terms of preparation because there's so many teams and so many players, coaches that have gone before them that have just that have just done what the barbarians do and there's yeah. been a lot of events and you know it gets real fancy the places you go for dinner and they have a, a magician come around and you know then they have s people singing um who you thought was a waitress the whole time <laughs> um so it's just a real sort of like you know it's real glamorous and like being in london it's uh it's pretty cool uh, that you get to do it with you know guys you know but then guys from Aussie and guys from South Africa and um, guys you never thought you'd ever be playing with. Mm. Do you get worried while you're on the piss and stuff that week that shit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to struggle this weekend <laughs> against the All Blacks? Do you ever get to that point? Bro, yeah, you do. There, there's a lot of head noise and there's, um, <laughs> there, you know, there's, I think you do, but you just understand, you just understand the assignment, eh? I think that's just the best way I possible I can put it. Yeah. Is that you just know that, you know, the team you're in and sort of the traditions that have gone before. And, you know, it's not been silly and it's not been, um, you know, no one's, not, it's not silly. It's just you're having beers with your mates, you know, you're enjoying your time. You're connecting with someone that's played on the other side of the world and who's had a, a way, you know, different upbringing. Um and that's a special thing about the barbarians is that you know by Thursday you've you know you've heard everyone's life story you've you've danced with your mate you've <laughs> seen him in some state and then now you're ready to go and play a game with them so that's you know that's a special thing about barbars yeah and you're obviously used to it because you backed up that um, week very well absolutely put on a clinic against the All Blacks um, so what what was it like when you're out there obviously playing with guys that you you all you knew very well, so um, what was that like? Yeah, it was it was cool, bro. Because um, obviously, you, I played against all these guys. I played with some of them, um, but you just know the challenge of playing the All Blacks, and like you really, you just really want to beat them because you really want to put, um, you just really want to put a good performance on, and, and kind of like, oh man, I should be there, not on this team. Um, you know, without being a dick about it, that's that's just you know how it is, and you know I just think the opportunity to play against the All Blacks was was special, bro. And it's you know to do it at Twickenham and to you know to almost beat them, you know I I still think I'm, I'm the one that lost the game. Nani ran a short ball and just and just bowled me over and scored, <laughs> and that was kind of like their way of climbing back. But everything before then was all right. But yeah, I was. That's a bit of a bummer, that one. And that wasn't the last <laughs> time that happened, too. Nani's, he's ran out <laughs> a few times. <laughs> <laughs> nah, yeah, they say go low away, and that's just the thing, eh? You're like, I've been low on him a couple of times, and low. it's still the same. <laughs> yeah, I think you got to go high and just get <laughs> steamrolled. I know, yeah, some of my sevens, eh? I kind of just wait for them to make the tackle and then just kind of, like, assist. Um I'm not a bad assist tackler. I'm not to say that much. I'm not bad at assisting. <laughs> <laughs> All the old ball, the ball rip. You don't mind the ball rip. <laughs> yeah. I just got to be the second player in. Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the problem.
was it the following week you were then called into the All Blacks and then playing for the All Blacks? Yeah, bro, yeah. There was a few of us. There was, um, yeah, it was, uh, Mitch Drummond and um, uh, Don Bird, uh, Dylan Hunt. You know, there was a few of us that, that had played for the Barbars. And then um, and then straight after, it was actually quite funny, we showered, we showered and then we hopped on the AB's bus to go back to the hotel <laughs> oh, after playing after playing them. So, um, yeah, that was, you know, and that was my first time being in the environment and, and thinking far out, you know. You've gone from one week that was just loose as anything yeah. and now you're in the AB's camp and so, yeah. <laughs> You're just making sure you you know everything's all good and you're not you're not being late to any meetings. So mm. no, it was cool. And did you feel more comfortable having just played against them and playing really well against them? Did that make the transition a little bit easier for you? Yeah, yeah, it did. It, it made it a lot easier, and it just um, I guess the other thing was that I wasn't the only one. You know, there was a few other guys that were just you know that were going in as well for the first time. So that made it a lot better and. And also the fact that, you know, you're in All Blacks camp now, you know, like this is legit where you want to be. Like you don't want to be anywhere else but here. So, you know, we had a good do and had fun time that week. But now you're like, hey, I've got to get my, got to get my shit together now. And I've got to, um, you know, I've got to put my best foot forward here. And did that game feel like a test match? What was the preparation like? Was it test match week like? Yeah, it was like, it was quite funny because, um, you know, you had two different teams. You had a team playing the French Barbarians. And so I remember we were warming up and, and doing our training around what we are doing that week. But then there was also another team that was getting ready to play France. Mm. Um, so, you know, it was, it was cool. I guess the time just went really quickly because um, – you're constantly learning, you're constantly doing things, you're constantly checking your phone and setting alarms <laughs> and then catching up with guys and, you know, because <laughs> I remember Davey, Davey was already in, the, he was in the All Black set at that stage and so I was literally on his case about everything about, you know, gee, what do we wear to this or what do we, what do we do here? Um, yeah. You know, and it gets a bit like that, eh, you know, it's like your first day of school, you just, you're on edge all the time. Anxiety levels through the roof, eh? Having to be scared of me missing a meeting or anything, eh? Bro, and that's it. I'm the worst, say, eh? you know? And I just like, you know, do I wear closed shoes or am I all good to wear scuffs? <laughs> or like, <laughs> it gets that bad, eh? You know, when you like question everything. And then you're like, shit, man, Steve was looking in at me funny for that. Like, did I do something or... Um, yeah, you know how to, it's just it's just all part of it, I guess, and that whole learning yeah. experience. Yeah. And after that game, did you how did you feel? Did you feel like an All Black after that game, even though it wasn't a test? Yeah, I, I did, I did, but I knew it wasn't the real thing. You know, for mm. me, I just was like, um, you know, I got the opportunity because, um, you know, two games are close together. You know, had, had there been a week or normal week's preparation, I wouldn't be there. You know, I was quite realistic about that, about, you know, I knew I was there and thereabouts, but um, the situation and the whole thing meant that I could be part of it. So I was happy, man. I was proud. Mm. Um, you know, proud. I, I got an all-black number, and, you know, I was able to put on the, the fern and perform the haka. Um, but I also knew, it was like, you know, this is... I didn't want it to end there. Yeah, and then your first game, your oh, your first test match, um, your debut against uh, Argentina was it or France? Yeah, France, France and Dunedin, um, down at Forsyth, and yeah, that was yeah, you know, you fought, that was in two eighteen. So, um, yeah, that was a cool moment, man. Like I had my family down there, um, you know, and. I guess that's when you sort of start to pinch yourself around, like, you know, you are amongst, like, you know, um, some really classy players. And I think every time I was sort of in the All Blacks environment or in the camp, I just wanted to keep doing enough to make sure that when the next camp happened, I was in the conversation or, or I was there training. So, yeah. And what do you like on the bench? First game for the All Blacks, sitting on the bench, what, 
what are the nerves like for you? You seem like <laughs> a very confident and chilled out customer, but um, All Black Test Match debut. Nah, I'm not, bro. I'm not. <laughs> the test match, that I was in all sorts, eh? I, I remember um, I came on and, bro, the, I came on. I didn't even know how they made the substitution and a penalty. So we had like a, um, I got subbed on and the first action was a kick to touch. Oh, that's true. But the kick to touch was, so I literally came on and I was kicking to touch. But the kick to touch was from five metres from our line and five metres from the sideline. <laughs> oh, the worst. <laughs> so it's like, I can't just come on and just like, you know, do the league ones where you just kick it five meters in front of you. <laughs> so I gave it a, a nudge. Bro, I literally just went out by this much, eh? True nudge. Like I was so close. <laughs> it ended up being ended up being like 45 meters up, oh. but I kicked it and I was just hoping. I was like, get out, get out. <laughs> um, luckily it went out. I was back then. I was quite notorious for not kicking the ball out. Um, <laughs> going for it, <laughs> <laughs> you know, going for it all the time, yeah. and um, you know it's pretty. You feel pretty. Um, you feel pretty bad when uh, you kick the ball, and all you do is kick it out, and it stays in field. Mm. Uh, some of the groans you get from your forwards. <laughs> uh, it's not nice. They always say before, when you're lying it up, just make sure of it. Make sure of it. Just get it out. <laughs> 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 bro, honestly, like that is like the worst thing you can say to someone that's about to kick out, uh, kick the touch, hey, like, kick it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Or, or when you go for a goal kick and they're like, take your time. <laughs> yeah. There's certain things that don't help, but, you know, you get used to it. Yeah, and one, one massive part of your All Black career to date has been your battle with Bodie for the number 10 jersey um he only said kind things about you when he came on the podcast obviously you guys have a really good relationship how have you found that battle between you and him oh bro it's been awesome like it's um you know the competition and the challenges are just like um you know as i said like you always want to be at the next camp and you want to be in the all blacks team and, and that's the challenge um that's a big challenge, you know, and then you get there and then there's another challenge and it's, and it's, you know, going down against, you know, um, another goat and someone who's just made his mark massively in the all black Jersey. Mm. And, you know, I'm real respectful of that. And I just love sort of putting my best foot forward and, you know, and, and making the competition healthy and, and, not in a bad way. I'm I'm growing him. He's growing me. But we know exactly what what we need to do to try and to try and wear the jersey. And I think that's just been something that uh, we've both enjoyed, and um, you know, something that has made both of us better has definitely made me better. And you obviously won the battle to the ten jersey for the Rugby World Cup. Uh, was there ever a moment uh, leading up to that competition where you were told that you were going to be given the ten jersey, or was it a week in week out? Just waiting for the team to be named. No, nah, it was it was literally just you're waiting for the team, mm. the team naming, and that's how um, you know that's I think that's a it's a good thing. You just you're always putting your best foot forward. You're always wanting to try your best. You're always just waiting, um, you know, to the last minute to know you know if you get the nod or not. And um, you know, I was lucky enough that you know in the World Cup to to get the nod, and I think. You know, even though Bodie was playing fullback, like man, there were so many things and so many valuable lessons that he was teaching me uh, in the ten jersey. And um, times we're in the games where he'd be at ten and I'd be at fullback, where it just we we just somehow ended up in our in that spot. Mm. So uh, it was good, and it was just something that like you know you get nervous about. You know, <laughs> sort of playing against someone like him makes me nervous. You know, because you know. Um, just how good and how influential he is yeah. uh, for whatever team he's playing. Right, that's cool. And how did you find the Rugby World Cup? What did what did you make of the whole experience? Bro, it was awesome. Like, it's just, you know, to be an All Black and then to play games with All Blacks is, is one thing, but to, to be going to a Rugby World Cup um, in a country like Japan was just awesome. You know, the support 
and the experience was awesome. Um, but, you know, the lessons we learned on the field was, was just as awesome, you know. For me, I think those were valuable lessons and I'm not disappointed by them, but I guess I'm more just um, encouraged that, you know, we got a few things wrong, but we were still so close. Um, but all in all, it was an awesome experience, one that, should I, I'll remember, you know, forever. Yeah, what memories do you have from the England game? Obviously, it was the disappointing one of the tournament. You guys were looking, re- you obviously looked really good against Ireland the week before. Yeah. Come to England in the semi final. What, what do you remember about that game? Bro, I, I just remember, like, um, I just remember having the ball a lot, but not going forward. Mm. <laughs> and, 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 I just remember the constant pressure of, of always being driven back in our tackles um, and almost like kind of looking around like, shit, like what, what do we do? Like what, what do we do now? Um, you know, and that, and that was a real tough lesson to learn on like on that stage, you know. It's just, you know, you wish you had learned these lessons or you wish you had thought of something before that game. Um, but, you know, just the way it rolled out, they were better than us. Um, you know, they studied us well, man, and they, you know, we we did nothing that surprised them, which was, um, you know, was really disappointing. Mm. And how was that to deal with afterwards? Are you someone who takes these losses to heart, or are you pretty quick to bounce on and take the positives from it and just get back to life? Yeah, I, I am, bro. Like, I, um, I'm a sore loser. Like, I, you're not used to it. I, I'm real competitive. I'm I'm real competitive, bro. I don't like losing, um, so it was real. It was real tough to experience that, and tough because for me, I remember feeling like I we didn't just let ourselves down. I felt I, I genuinely felt like we let you know the whole of New Zealand down, and I felt like man, like it's gonna be a long summer being back home and no one wants us there. Like, uh, these were thoughts going through my head, eh? You know, like, um, I remember, you know, Snapchatting some of the boys and I was in my room, like, dealing, you know, through sort of comedy and I was putting these disguises uh, on, you know, saying, like, this is how I'm getting back home so no one recognises me. Um, But, you know, overall, like, I'm... I'm pretty quick to, to move on otherwise and um, pretty, you know, I'm good enough to sort of know that, um, you know, the ones that, you know, the opinions of the ones that matter most are sort of what really, you know, what I care about. So. And last season, you guys obviously had some really good performances again, um, probably let down by a couple towards the end, which probably still hanging over the side a little bit. But what sort of shape do you think the All Blacks are in? going forward into this season? Well, I think um, I think the boys are in a really good spot. Like, I, I think I think we're just spoiled for choice, eh? Hey? There's so many positions where I think guys are putting their hands up and, um, you know, I think what you saw last season was, you know, a result of, man, it was a long season for the boys that had been away on tour. Um, yeah. You know, and that's no excuse, you know? Um you know, we're, we're professional rugby players and um, I think there are definitely things we could have learned faster and things we couldn't done, could have done differently. But, you know, hindsight's beautiful for that. But I do genuinely believe that um, have we get those little things right and have we changed this and, and do this a bit better, um, you know, the boys are going to be in some form, you know. But what I'm sort of more excited about are the guys that sort of stepped up in that, you know, end of your tour, you know, the likes yeah. of a Dalton, um, you know, and you see glimpses of, of Hoskins and um, guys that are still so young, but, you know, have a lot ahead of them and, you know, with things done differently and, and um, you know, just being a bit more prepared, I think these boys will be, uh, will be a good, will be good to go. Mm, exciting times, exciting times ahead. And what's what's the plans for you? Have you got how long you signed with New Zealand Rugby Union? Have you got much plans ahead of that? Um, at the moment, as of uh, now, I'm only signed yeah. for this year, um, for 2022. Yeah, so um, you know, hopefully can re-sign. Um, you know, 
crew with New Zealand rugby, but um, at the moment, just enjoying my break, it's it's been awesome. And um, you know, when I can get back in, that's when I can start sorting sort that stuff out as well. Mm. Are you looking to stay in New Zealand your whole career, um, Crusaders, Canterbury man, for life, or would you <laughs> be tempted to go overseas at some point? Yeah, I think I think the um, the thought of going overseas is exciting for me. I think. Um, I have a family now and I think goals and things change. Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, enjoying where I am playing rugby is number one, but also doing what's best for my family and being able to, um, provide for them and, uh, also to give my family a cool experience somewhere overseas, whether it be over in Europe or Japan, I think those will be pretty cool memories that you can make with your family and, Mm. You know, you only look at other boys that have done it as well, you know, like a Bender and, you know, Andy Ellis was over there and Desi was over there and a lot of guys that have gone over there with the family and just created um, such great uh, experiences. 100%. And life after rugby, have you thought that far ahead? What have you got planned? I know you're doing a lot of modelling, Man. jockey, a little bit of um, <laughs> replay, replay denim with the... yeah. Real good um, shoots, but uh, oh, mate. To be fair, I'm I'm not too sure. It's it's a tough one. I think one thing I do know is that it'll be probably involved in footy. I think yeah, uh, maybe being an agent would be quite cool for me. Um, I have an agent who who used to play rugby, who kind of gets it, and I feel like that's a crucial part of being an agent. Where I've experienced mm. both sides where you know, you get looked after someone that might not get it or, or doesn't understand it fully. And then I think that it'll be pretty cool to be helpful to players that can come across problems and solve problems that you've been through yourself, you know. Mm. The likes of um, financial advice and uh, pressures of, of rugby and also uh, looking after them um, in terms of sponsorship deals and stuff like that. So I think that'll be maybe one thing, but... I, I would always say I didn't want to go down the coaching um, <laughs> coaching or commentating way, but, yeah, who knows? If um, if I get pretty desperate, I might have to start <laughs> putting the uh, whistle around my neck. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, you'd be a bloody good player agent. Oh, geez, I'm sure a lot of people would like to be looked after <laughs> by you. That's a hell of a career. Yeah, I'm not too sure if I'll have half these sponsorship deals I have now, so that could be a big problem, but... Um, <laughs> But, you know, I don't know, be a brownies mattress, man. You know, if you're looking for a brownies, uh, if you're looking for a mattress yourself, you know, you can you can kick your old bed into touch, mate, and brownies will find a bed for you, mate. <laughs> hey, oh, you're good. There's your job, lifetime ambassador for brownies. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you... so, man. You've got to play that one for them. <laughs> but you do have all sorts of sponsorship um, deals, don't you? You're, you're running all sorts of deals and... Um, you know, you're a big influencer, I guess it's called these days. But how do you find that side of your rugby life? Oh, I find it rewarding, bro. I think it's cool. Um, you know, you don't want to be that guy that's on, on the back of everything and, um, <laughs> you know, he's got his fingers in all these pies and you're that guy that's with them and that, and that person. But um, sort of like it because it's rewarding of, of the work you do, you know, and it's, mm. um, you know, I guess one of the main reasons – you know, is because, you know, I'm head of uh, the Perks Committee uh, with yeah. the Crusaders. And, uh, <laughs> no, nah, I've actually, I've actually been, I've actually been um, demoted. I've, Will Jordan now, because he had <laughs> such an awesome year last year, he's actually head of the Perks Committee, but I'm more of his assistant. And, um, you know, as much freebies as we can give the boys as possible, it's just, it just keeps things rolling. And it's a big part of our team, Perks Committee. Mate, I could imagine the perks coming in from you and Will would be through the roof. <laughs> yeah, we're working on on oh. on giving a house away to one of the boys, but um, <laughs> that's in the pipeline. I'm not too sure when that will happen, but we're working on that. Oh, good, he'll be lining up. He's been looking for years, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's been. He's been. I think he's just found one, but yeah, he's probably most deserving. Oh, goody. Um, yeah, he's he's definitely most deserving. That's for sure. Mate, well, as always, we've gone to our Instagram for some questions, and I do say it all the time that I get heaps of questions, but, mate, literally, 
I reckon this is a new PB. So many questions from so many people all around the world. A uh, question that came up a heap, uh, this first question was about the NRL. I know Geordie mentioned it um, on his Waterlad podcast and it sort of blew out a wee bit, but would you ever consider playing NRL? Oh, bro, for sure, man. I'd, I'd love to. Um, you know, I'd probably say I watch more NRL than I do Super Rugby, but, yeah. um, you know, it's just something that, you know, you always sort of imagine yourself doing and you kind of wonder, like, you know, what what would it be like? How would I go? Um, but I'll definitely give it a crack. Do I think I'll be good? I actually, I don't think I would have, you know, the same influence or the same impact I do on footy, to be honest. Um, but the likes of Geordie Man and the likes of those other guys, those guys would definitely be, would definitely be gun league players. Would you see yourself as a seven? Yeah, yeah, I'd be in the halves, man. I, um, yeah, you know, the old short ball out the back, oh. I think that would, you know. Deadly. Short kicking game. Deadly, <laughs> Short kicking game. <laughs> Not too sure how my cross kicks would go, but um, it would be cool. It would be cool to experience it, but uh, I don't think I'd be any good, to be honest. How do you reckon an um, all-black league side would go against an NRL team? Bro, to be honest, I, you know, I'd want to say it would go good, but I just think um, people that, Maybe they have this position that league is kind of easy to play, you know, because you roll the ball, there's there's not much to it. But I'd say because of just how much I know is um, strategically and how taxing it is on their wrestling, yeah. uh, there's all that, the grappling they do, um, the speed of the ruck, I just think we'll get smashed, to be honest, <laughs> eh? to be fair. I think, that, yeah, mate, that's a, you make a good case there. I think people don't give it enough credit. <laughs> As it deserves, they like they run some lines, all their shapes and stuff. No, I, I honestly, no, they don't, bro. They don't, and I think you know people say this person would be a main league player, but um, you know, there's so much to it, you know. And I'm saying that I haven't even played league. I just kind of could imagine the line running, um, you know, and 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 all that jazz. Um, what I do know is that I'll probably get moved to the wing on defense because some of those boys are massive. <laughs> some of those boys are massive, eh? You know, you get a big Nelson running down your channel. Um, yeah, big you boy. Know, he's a big boy, and those hookers and guys are making ridiculous amounts of tackles. Mate, that's exciting, though. Geordie and Richie in the halves for the Warriors in a few years. Love that. Bro, I'd love it, man. Yeah, get the old... Mad Butcher and uh, <laughs> get in there, get him in there, it'd be awesome. You're always looking for deals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just one I can't crack on is, is uh, you know, the meat, uh, sort of some sort of meat company, eh? That's one I'm working <laughs> on for the lads. Oh, mate, I'm sure Dan Perrin at Nelson Mad Butcher will um, sort you out. We'll, yeah, we'll get yeah. that on. Uh, sure. Us, surely. Okay, next question. Who shapes your goatee? Tamari Allison. <laughs> Somebody Allison. Wow, that's 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 interesting. I actually, um, yeah, my barber does it for me. Um, all the shaping on my goatees and and all my beards. Um, I think he's just angry. One time I caught him out on his because um, he went for something a bit different. He went for something a bit thin along here, and I just sort of caught him out on it. Um, so I think he's a bit he's a bit sour at that comment. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't, actually didn't know it hit him that hard that he had to sort of jump on what a lad to, to put, a, put a question out there about it. Sorry, sorry, Tom. Holy heck. Oh, you got him deep. I got him deep, man. Okay, next one from another good lad, Seta Tamanavalu. Uh, tell the story about when he nearly got a hiding from a parking warden in the morning of the 2018 finals. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a funny story. Eh? That's actually one I'd, I'd kind of forgotten about. Um, <laughs> but we go to this one cafe before um, on game day, you know, for a brunch. Mm. Uh, we go to we go to one and it's in Merivale Bridget's and there's a McDonald's behind it. And you know how sometimes they're real strict about you can't park in the McDonald's and go over there or, or whatever. Yeah. So that you know they're they're that strict where they have this one parking warden 
who actually is looking for guys that are parking in McDonald's and aren't going into McDonald's. So we parked in Macca's anyway. We ran around the long way. And uh, as we were coming back to go to the car after brunch, he just wasn't happy, eh? And, um, you know, being the sort of smart ass I am, like I was, um, I was kind of just saying, it wasn't us, it wasn't us. And there was a car trying to get out, but he was telling us off. And I was like, sir, watch out. The car's going to hit you. Sir, please watch out. And I was just being, I was being a dick. And um, <laughs> he turned around to me and he said, oh, shut up. <laughs> and uh, I honestly thought, I thought he was going to give me a hiding aid, to be fair. Um, but it was at that moment, I sort of, I just like, that's it. He's going to, um, he's going to karate chop me, I reckon. So that was that story. It was, you know, kind of the ones you had to sort of be there. Um, to sort of get it. Um, what I'm probably more surprised about is that you could read Seth's his, um, his message. <laughs> you kind of probably had to sort of get a translator to to make sure that that's what he was saying. But that was a good memory. Yeah, you know, he's got good memory, big Setter. He he loves a good yarn. The big man. <laughs> but he does. Yeah, you're right. I did have to um, reword it a little bit. <laughs> but speaking of fights, the next question. Uh, next question was: You're a huge fight. You're a huge fight sports fan. Would you consider doing MMA or boxing during or post footy? Oh man, bro, probably not. Eh? I, I think I'll probably think I'd be like top three in New Zealand of like shadow boxing. <laughs> like I'd be up there. <laughs> like honestly, bro, you should see my shadow boxing. It's like everything just looks. Um, it's poetry in motion, but. Like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe the like some have said that um you know not my words but to be fair like i just um i'm probably just too scared to get hit eh? um <laughs> but i do love i do love the combat you know the combat sport man ufc and, and boxing um always been into it since i was little and just sort of love that um love sort of the what they go through as athletes and I think there can't be any more sort of daunting and, you know, scary than being in a ring, putting yourself out there and throwing hands, man. And I think yeah. that's why I love it so much because of the fighters that I watch and the fighters that I follow on Instagram, like their mindset is just different. And mm. I think, um, you know, once people understand what they actually go through, they'll give that sport a bigger appreciation mm. maybe they should try and get you in the ring for a um, fight for life shadow boxing that would be good to watch <laughs> <laughs> bro if we could like somehow like have pillows as as gloves <laughs> like i'm all for it man you know I don't, um but yeah i think some of the boys at training get annoyed eh because you know i'll be in the corner and all you could hear is um and i'm just over there throwing combos um but it is funny, eh? Some of the boys get real annoyed. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Okay, next one. Would you ever play for Tonga? Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I I definitely would. I, I think even before rule, rule changes and before combos about, you know, possible teams, um, you know, I wanted to play for um, the Tongan league team, you know? Oh, yeah. Seeing their success over the years and... Um, their success over tier one nations and just how they could, um, you know, bring a country together was pretty inspiring for me and, and taking pay cuts and whatnot. And, and, um, just the honor and the, what a privilege it was for them to put a Tongan jersey on was pretty special. So I always thought if I did move to league or if I did play league, I always wanted to play, um, for Tonga and, um, uh, in, in league. True. What about Union, the three-year stand-down post All Black career? Yeah, bro. Yep, definitely. I, I yeah, definitely. Although I'm Samoan too, so um, yeah, so, Samoan Tong. I would definitely play for them. I'm not too sure which one. True. I, I would play for, but what would decide that? Um, probably who's going better at the time. <laughs> no, <laughs> James. Um, <laughs> Probably the Ford packs would decide that, bro. I don't know. <laughs> um, nah, I, I'd say my gut says I, I'd play for Tonga. Yeah. It's, um, you know, in my family, it's 
um, you know, we've had more of a Tongan upbringing and um, we've sort of indulged more in our Tongan culture, to be fair. So, yeah. Oh, Tongan community will be happy to hear that. That's good stuff. Okay, next question. Thoughts on Geordie Barrett outside you at 12? Um, man, what what people don't know is that he's actually, we've, we've played some games of me at 10 and him at 12 with Canterbury. Um, That's right. When he was just a young lad out of, um, you know, Lincoln Uni, he was playing 12. And, man, he's, um, yeah, I think that, you know, as, I think wherever he plays, bro, he's, he's world class. And I think um, his size at twelve is going to be is going to be awesome, you know. But just his physicality as well. Uh, you lose nothing in a playmaker. He's he's a playmaker. He's a kicker. He's um, he, he's he's world class. So you could put him at centre. He'd be awesome. Yeah, you put him anywhere. I reckon he's he's world class. I agree. Yeah. And this question we're gonna I feel like I'm gonna get every week until um we start seeing him play, but thoughts on Roger to have asked a Sheck at twelve? Oh deadly bro. I think he's gonna be awesome, eh? Um you just kinda know, I think I think you kinda just have to have seen his league career and, and what he's done at every you know, with the Roosters and at the Warriors and um he hasn't always been behind good teams at the Warriors, but one thing you know when you're watching the Warriors is that he's the best player on the field. Like, it's just, yeah. it's crazy the influence that he has on his team, especially when he's in a losing team or he's in a team that's losing by 20. It just doesn't seem to phase him. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's probably been the only thing, you know, keeping me watching the Warriors was him when he, when he was there. Um <laughs> amongst all the hard times and but it, yeah I think he's going to go good mm. and I do hope he goes good you know he's someone that will just make the best out of uh, out of everything he gets so yeah it's cool to see guys come from league over eh? yeah yeah and I, th- I hope it happens you know more often and it happens the other way too yeah one thing I'm actually really glad about is they put um, him at 12 and not Rico at 12 because um, I don't think I don't think uh, Rog would have seen any ball if he was playing thirteen <laughs> and Rico was playing twelve. Eh? <laughs> I'm probably yeah. That's probably just that's probably the best outcome already. So <laughs> he's already uh, he's already doing well. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Okay, next one. What's your quad workout? We got this one a few times. I didn't even notice how big your quads were, but a lot of feedback <laughs> on how nice your quads are. Probably it's that, or it could be how small the shorts are. That's that's the other thing that people don't seem to <laughs> think that about. The secret, <laughs> that's the <a>, secret. <laughs> I wish I knew that. I would have wore triple XS. XS, yeah, and that's it. Um, you know, and another one is a Luke McCullough. So you know, you big hype around his legs, but people don't realise he was actually wearing size small shorts. <laughs> really. Nah, that's a yarn. I actually just love. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a yarn. Uh, nah, I got tiny legs, man. But I do love uh, the gym. Um, I love my lifting and love the sort of how technical it is in terms of like a clean and jerk or a snatch or um, sort of body movements and stuff. Um, mm. I kind of have to be careful who I talk, you know, who I talk to about that sort of stuff because it's. It can be really boring to some people, eh? Or, or they kind of wonder, like, <laughs> why are you watching videos of someone lifting all the time? <laughs> um, but that, yeah, that was probably an influence that Owen Franks had on me. So, yeah. Oh, true. Because Owen Franks is your brother in law, right? Yeah, bro. Yep. Yeah. He's my brother in law. Yeah. How's, what's that relationship like? Um, bro, it's cool, man. It's, um, you know, he was actually a huge part in. And me, you know, being where I am now, uh, when I left school and, you know, when I was playing for Linwood Seniors, I was living with Owen at the time. Um, And before we knew each other through our wives, um, he knew my older brothers. uh, They went to Crush Each Boys High too. So, you know, we'd cross paths and, you know, I was too small to sort of to talk with him and to sort of get to know him but um 
but he, we just kind of uh, vibed that way and I was off to work on a scooter like at 7am going concreting and he was off to to go train for the Crusaders and he was living his he was living my dream too so I was able to see that you know daily of, of what you know ultimate professional look like mm. um and you, because it was so close and because someone in the same house was doing that it just um it made it so real that i, I could possibly maybe be his teammate or, or or be you know be a professional rugby player one day mm. and there's not too many more professional guys than the franks brothers eh? they are they were always next level <laughs> in their preparation yeah. and professionalism. Yeah, what I realised is that, you know, he was the exception in, in terms of, you know, I was seeing what he was eating and his daily routines and how professional he was. And, um, yeah, he is world-class, man. No one does it like him. And you talk to anyone in the rugby environment in New Zealand, um, they all say the same thing about Owe and his work ethic and just yeah. as... Uh, you know, the sacrifice and how dedicated he is. Mm, 100%. Okay, next one. Um, in your opinion, top three tens of all time? Um, one, Daniel Carter. Um, two, Johnny Wilkinson. Mm. And three... Um, Three, I'd have to say, can be yourself. I was a, <laughs> no, I was a big Larkin fan, but um, I have to say, uh, Carlos Spencer. Oh yeah, mm. yeah, all different players, but Carlos was very creative and in, in the way he was, you know, doing things in that time and that area that he was era he was playing in, which no one had seen before. Um, which sort of just inspired me to sort of be creative, you know, and sort of, um, yeah, it, it was cool. It was cool to watch that. I'd say those three, yeah. Mm, nice. Okay, next one. Surely some chat around his involvement in the horse game. <laughs> I know you part owner of a champion horse. Uh, yeah, it's, um, to be fair, like I, I, I didn't grow up watching horses or, or um, I didn't know too much about the, you know, the racing industry, but, uh, was just real lucky to to have a horse named after me. Really, that that's how that's sort of as simple as that. The horse named mm -hmm. after me. Um, he was over in Sydney. Um, he was looking, you know, pretty good. And um, the ten percent that I own just goes to Child Cancer Foundation, which is um, a foundation and charity that I'm an ambassador for. Um, and one that I think, you know, um, is well deserving of, of all the winnings that Monga gets. So uh, that's my small involvement in the, as well as, you know, watching every Saturday and having a wee punt. <laughs> Mate, that's awesome. You're, the horse that's named after you turns out to be a champion. It's always disappointing when they name one and it turns out to be a donkey, <laughs> but you won. They've named it yeah. and it turns out to have the goods. Yeah, well, man, here's, here's hoping for another good season. Um, yeah, Mong has had a pretty good pre-season from what I've heard and uh, he's looking in good nick and um, just waiting for the return and, you know, it's pretty special to watch, you know, when you're involved and it, it's named after yourself but even when you're cheering it on to, you know, for, for winning to go to such a good charity and, to, you know, yeah, um, something like Child, Child Cancer Foundation that sort of makes it a lot, a lot better. Mm, mate, you're such a good lad, love that. Okay, next one. This one's from your analysis, JG. Most influential player in New Zealand rugby. And this, again, can be yourself. Um, I have two. Oh, I have three. I, I'd say, I'd say in New Zealand, I'd say the three most influential players are uh, Aaron Smith, um, Adi Savia, and Geordie Barrett. Nice. At, at, I'd probably say at the moment, I'd probably say Geordie Barrett is, is the most influential player, yeah. Um, I just sort of love the, I don't know, the way he wears his heart on his sleeve and he's such a, just the, his aggression and his, um, you know, I've, I've been around him to know that he doesn't like losing and even to watch the game in the weekend, um, 
you see how special he is as a player and what he's willing to do to to win the game or, or if it's not winning the game, what he's willing to do to try and hurt someone, which is quite it's quite funny to watch. That tackle on Leicester, well, it took a big, hard <laughs> shot to stop Leicester five metres from the line, eh? Man, honestly, and that's, it's not surprising, you know, when you know Jordy and you know him well too, mm. um, you know, actions like that and things like that, he's just, um, you know, and being the the little brother of, a, you know, Bodie and Scooter, um, yeah, he's probably had to deal with a lot growing up to... <laughs> to overcome some obstacles you can, see so. it, eh? <laughs> you can you can see it man and it's uh that's what makes geordie geordie and that's what that's why he's the man that's it and a lad okay last question one piece of advice you have for our listeners oh wow always love ending on a inspirational wow oh no pressure I, I think um i don't know i don't know I don't have a quote as such. I think um, just, I guess, your mindset and your attitude. I think, um, you know, seeing the best in shitty situations, um, having a different perspective um, always helps and always sort of what it sort of gives you an understanding of where you really are and what you really have and what really matters. And I think it's a, a cool thing about it. Um, Mate. So, yeah. That's probably that's probably really disappointing, eh? I'm sorry, man. That was <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I actually loved it. I thought it was <laughs> awesome because, mate, you live by that. And hearing your story, it feels like your whole your whole career has been around that, mate. You've had you had confidence as a young fella. You always thought you were gonna become who you are today, and that's it's so cool to hear. And it's all been around based on your mindset, like you just spoke about in your advice. So. Oh, you might not have felt it was good, but that was one of the best. Thanks, brother. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for that wee pump up. But, mate, absolute pleasure to have have you on the podcast, mate. Like, um, it's great to sit down with one of the greats and um, go through your journey. I know you're still so young, so still plenty left uh, in your rugby career, which I'm really looking forward to watching as well. So, um, looking forward to seeing you back out there with the Crusaders. Um, not that they need any help, but mate, no doubt you're going to make a massive difference for them, and I'm um, looking forward to seeing you. Back out there running the cutter. So appreciate you coming on the podcast, mate. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, bro. You're a lad.